Nikki, it's lecture four today, and we have a lot to talk about with acoustic properties of tissues. And I've changed it up a little bit. I'm really going to talk a lot about skulls, so I'm really kind of excited about this lecture today. Yeah, a lot of questions popped up from the last set of lectures. What about the skull? What about the frequencies, attenuation? I think you're going to nail it all today. Oh, excellent. I'm excited. Yeah, yeah that's pretty good. Um, yeah, so let's just get started. There's a bunch of things I want to talk about today. I'm going to talk about it attenuation in general. So um, if we're trying to get focus ultrasound into depth and what's happening with the beam as it gets attenuated. Then we're gonna talk about skull attenuation in particular. We're gonna talk about SDR. I'll explain what that means. Then we'll talk a little bit about reflection, refraction and the layer thickness. And then lastly, conclude with nonlinearity, frequency content and attenuation. All right, big, big list for today. <laughs> So let's see, let's talk about attenuation in general. Whenever we apply ultrasound, uh, there's a pressure wave and the pressure wave is gonna fall off exponentially with depth. So the equation is shown here. The top line has the, uh, the part where the sinusoid is um, oscillating back and forth. And if you just wanna talk about the envelope, we use the second uh, line right there. And so what we see is that the pressure wave is gonna fall off with an attenuation coefficient alpha, which here is given in nephris per centimeter. And this is at a particular frequency. So there's no frequency dependence explicitly given in that uh, equation and then it falls off with depth. So it falls off exponentially. All right, so um, given that that's true, what do you think, what, like, what do you think, should we be able to see that on ultrasound images? Definitely. Yeah, you definitely you should, <laughs> right. And the first image I'm gonna show you is this is beautiful picture. What do, you, what do you see in this picture? It looks like a baby to me. It does. The baby? Yeah. And you can see the head over there on the left and you can see the spine and a little leg over there. That's pretty cute. All right, so um, as you look at this picture though, you would say, hey, it's flat gray. There's, there's no loss of signal. So let me just back up a moment and tell you how ultrasound images work. Okay, so they're always shown with the transducer up here and then the ultrasound is sent out. And in this case, this is a a curved planar transducer, and we'll use a subset of the elements, we'll send a, a beam out, and then uh, we'll get reflections coming back from different depths uh, as, they, as the beam gets reflected back, and then we send another one out over here, and as it goes through the tissue, we'll get reflections back, and et cetera, and then we measure up all those, we, we count up all those reflections, and then we make an image out of it. All right, so now what I've just told you is that as the beam goes into the tissue, then the signal is going to decrease. And so you would think that as you go along this line, then, you know, you might start out with a very high signal and then it's going to decrease exponentially. And then what is coming back now, those echoes that are going to come back and we're going to make the image out of, that those are also going to be decreasing exponentially. So you would think that the image would look darker and darker. And you do see some darkness down here, but generally it looks sort of like it's a flat gray all across it, which is kind of interesting like why is it flat gray why does it not get attenuated and the truth is is that the computer knows that it should be attenuated and it knows that there's sort of a, a constant attenuation in soft tissue and so it's going to compensate for that so all those echoes that are coming back at these deeper and deeper depths it's just going to bump up the signal and give it a gain based on the time that it's coming back and being measured by the transducer and so that's what time gain control is based on the time it's going to apply a gain in order to equalize the signal across the image. Why does, the, it... uh, does the computer assume just a constant attenuation for the yeah. whole it, image? That's right. And it has, the computer has no idea what's in there. And in fact, there's some interesting things about this picture. So fluid, for example, so this is all amniotic fluid here, has very low attenuation. This has low speckle pattern. And so that's kind of interesting. Um, the low speckle pattern, you can see why it's, it's got low signal. Um, let me just show you another set of images in which you can very clearly see attenuation. Now, this is a really interesting picture right here. We have fluid-filled structures, just like the amniotic fluid that we saw before. And up here, for example, it's just fluid and there's very low attenuation. So the echoes that are coming through there have very low attenuation compared to the echoes that the signal that comes through here. And as a result, because it has very low attenuation, now this is very, very bright much brighter than the signal that's coming back from over here. Now the computer doesn't know that it went through the gallbladder, a bag of fluid. It doesn't know that it shouldn't bump up the signal. And so you see that it, it ends up being a little bit too bright right there. And now we can contrast that to this area over here where there's gallstones. 
And so what we see, these are calcified structures and they have very, very high attenuation. So what that means is beyond those, the echoes that are coming back beyond it have very, very low signal. Again, the computer has no idea whether the echoes that are coming back are coming back from uh, beyond fluid filled structures or coming back beyond calcified structures. And so it doesn't know how to fix the image. And so as a result, we can see areas where there's low attenuation, you know, bright signal and areas where there was high attenuation and now uh, we have low signal. So you can very clearly see it in the images sometimes if you look carefully. All right, so this is our attenuation. This is the equation that we saw before. We have our pressure wave, it falls off exponentially. And now I put the frequency dependence explicitly. So here our attenuation is a nepers, our coefficient is given in nepers per centimeter per megahertz. And then you multiply times the depth in order to get how that pressure wave falls off. And then also you multiply times your frequency. Um, okay, so down below what we see is a table that's giving a number of different values. So we have water, very low attenuation, aqueous soft tissue, kind of, it's, you know, got a, a reasonable attenuation. And then what we see is that bone has a much, much higher attenuation than the aqueous soft tissue. So when we think about the brain, we're just going to think about it as aqueous soft tissue. And then the bone, the skull, we're going to say is, is, is uh, you know, much, much higher. And we'll get into what the attenuation is a bone in a little bit. It's actually quite variable depending on the bone structure. But this is just kind of a, a round number just to show you that, in fact, it's quite a bit higher than the aqueous soft tissue. Um, okay, so um, then the other thing, oftentimes attenuation, rather than uh, talking about the attenuation coefficient in NEPRs, we can talk about it in dB. So that's just using the dB scale. So that's given over here on the right. So the relative signal level given in dB is 20 log of the, the ratio of the pressure over the original pressure that was sent out. So if there's a, um, a loss in pressure, then that ratio, and then take log base 10 and then times 20. And that's equal now to our attenuation coefficient. But if it's explicitly given in, uh, per centimeter per megahertz, then you put in explicitly the depth and the frequency. Um, you might ask, well, what if we have our intensity loss? Well, intensity is proportional to the square of the pressure. And so what we do is we take the, the two that's out in front, and then we use that to square the pressure ratio. And so now we have a 10 out in front, 10 log of the ratio of the intensities. It gives you the same answer. So if, for example, you have minus 3 dB, then you know that the intensity loss is a half. And um, if it's a, a minus 10 dB, then our intensity loss is, it's, 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 a, it's a factor of one tenth. Okay? Looks good. All right, so, um, all right, so um, one point to note is you can go back and forth between the attenuation coefficient in NEPRs and attenuation coefficient in dB. If you wanted to, you could work out the math. There is a, just a, a constant right there. We don't really have to get into it right now. It'd be kind of fun if you wanted to figure that out, but anyway, we'll just keep going. <laughs> you, you talked about uh, acoustic impedance last in the last lecture, I think, right? Can yeah, you, yeah, we did. Can, can you convert between these two um, value sets easily or are they different? Uh, yeah, they're different. So acoustic impedance doesn't tell you about the attenuation. The acoustic impedance tells you um, about the reflection in an interface. And once you calculate that reflection, then you can, you can translate it into um, a loss, a loss term. Okay, so different types of losses. And I think you're going to get to this, but when we think about attenuation, uh, where is this uh, energy going? Ah, uh, yeah, Why that's a great question. We're maybe going to talk, talk about, about it later. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. Okay. Okay, so attenuation in dB. Oh, yeah, so here's the math, how you can figure out the attenuation coefficient in uh, dB is related to the in NEPRs. Let's, let's just skip over that one, okay? <laughs> you can pause so, here and review if you need. <laughs> oh, yes, let's, let's keep going. <laughs> okay, so um, it's really very um, useful to be able to remember some of these um, relationships. So if the measured, if the, if the signal you're looking at is one half of what was sent out, then it's a relative sound intensity is minus three dB. If it's one tenth, then it's minus 
uh, 10 dB. And then um, you can get to many other uh, relationships because if you remember that if you um, multiply the ratio of the intensities, then you're adding the dB factors. So for example, if what you're looking at is uh, one quarter of what was uh, um, originally there, then you just have that minus 3 dB and you're adding another minus 3 dB, so you get minus 6 dB. And then you can just do the same thing with the, um, the, the factor of one-tenth. It's actually really interesting because an ultrasound system will typically be able to measure about 60 dB. So it has a dynamic range of 60 dB. So if it gives out a certain pressure level, then what it gets back, what it can actually measure and make signal and make images from is 60 dB smaller. And so that's actually, now you look at the numbers, 60 dB is gonna be one one millionth of what you sent out. So it can measure and make images of a pressure level that's one one millionth or the, the, the intensity level is one one millionth of what was sent out. I would so have thought pretty, that, the, uh, the, that the imaging would have gone further than it did, I guess, to does the system shut itself off when it knows it's sort of exceeding like that uh, signal to noise ratio? Uh, well, so if the, um, the signal that comes back is smaller than that, then the, the system will just filter it out. They'll say it's noise and it's smaller than that. Gotcha. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's keep going here. And one question you might ask is, well, we want to have an effect at some depth into the brain. How do we know what frequency to use? We know there's going to be attenuation. And the, that means we're going to have our signal loss. How do we know what, what's up sort of optimal here? And so I have a couple of slides here, kind of going through some, some thoughts here on how you calculate that. Um, let's say, for example, that we have our pressure wave. Um, it's given by the equation we see right there. We've explicitly put in the frequency dependence. Um, the intensity uh, is uh, shown right there. And it's got a, a factor of, of two because um, it was squared. And, um, and then so uh, if you look at the normalized intensity down below, then what you see is that they fall off with depth, just like we talked about, and there's more fall off at the higher frequencies. So if you wanna get an effect deep into the tissue, then you might think to yourself, well, I want a lower frequency in order to make sure that I have enough intensity reaching our depth. So that's one factor. But, um, and, and this is just that if you put the skull in place, the skull is gonna take out some of the, 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 the power. And so it just lo lowers all those values, but the same conclusion is there. You might think at this point, I'm just gonna go with the lowest uh, frequency that I can, right? But there's more to the equation. <laughs> and that is just that if you wanna have an effect, you have to have some absorption. At some absorbed power at the focus. And so now what we have is not just, you know, there's a, a part of this equation, so that's what we sent out. There's the, um, the loss term uh, at the focus, and then there's the absorption term. And so we want to sort of um, minimize the loss while sort of maximizing the absorption um, in order to have an effect. And so because of that, now what you see when you put all that all together is that you, you don't necessarily make the same choice. And now this is uh, showing you as a function of frequency for certain different depths. So if you wanna go very, very close in, uh, maybe at, at one centimeter, then you could get away with much higher frequencies. But let's say you wanna go to a depth of six centimeter deep in the brain. Now you can see that there's some optimum because these two factors here are trading off against each other. And you can see that there's an optimum. And that's what was shown in the red dotted line is sort of the optimum as a function of depth. So as we get to deeper depths, we're gonna go end up having this curve getting pushed to lower and lower frequencies, but not, not as low as we can go. There's definitely an optimum. And, and right now this is showing here on this curve that it's about a megahertz. And so we put a skull in, and now what the skull is gonna do is take out some of that power. And so as a result, it's gonna push us a little bit further over on the left, a little bit more to lower frequencies. And you can see now at that six centimeter depth, we're, we're maybe about 600 kilohertz, 500 to 700 kilohertz. Yeah, what, what's the frequency you operate at? For, well, it depends on the transducer you're looking at, but I, I always end up somewhere in the 600s for most of my projects. Right, it depends on the transducers and we'll talk about how the transducers are very specific to the frequency, but you choose a transducer based on the frequency you want, right? Yeah, and Kim will tell you it is uh, 
even you know far more complicated than this simple sort of two component system that she's showing. Right. Of other things. There's other factors that play a role here. Um, the focal spot size, for example, um, the higher frequency you go, the smaller the focal spot size. So a um, number of different factors. Okay, so, and as I mentioned before, when we were talking about whether or not this was a plane wave, that this is sort of, you know, I think of it as independent of the focusing aspect. So what, have we, what we're showing right here is a transducer that's focusing to a part uh, deep in the brain. And just, um, and we'll talk about this more, how you end up with uh, um, the pressure, you know, coming together and getting focused, obviously, and, um, and that the amplification you get from the focusing, giving you more pressure here, is separate from the attenuation term. And so um, I just, you know, kind of think about them independently. Can you tell us about the, the term focal gain really quick, Kim? Like when people talk about focal gain with transducers. Yeah, so there's a certain pressure that comes off the face of the transducer and there's a certain pressure at the focus. And then the gain is the ratio of one versus the other. And so what you can see right here that the pressure at the coming off the transducer is very low and the value right here. So it's normalized to this value, but you can see that there's clearly very high gain uh, with, this, um, uh, with this focusing. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more uh, about that, maybe give you some equations for the gain. And we'll talk a little bit more about focal spot size. You know, you could measure it from uh, um, looking at a picture like this, and you could look at the width and the length, look at the, the minus three dB or the minus six dB curves, or you could look at a plot like this and look at the, the three dB, for example. So different ways of looking at that. Um, okay, so we need to get a little bit more into attenuation. What is attenuation? Attenuation is a loss of the power, but there's a number of things that play a role there. There's absorption and scattering, there's uh, reflection and refraction, and we don't typically tend to think about reflection and refraction as playing a role in attenuation, kind of separate them out. Um, but uh, let's tell you a little bit more about absorption and scattering, which are the big components right here. Don't get me wrong, reflection and refraction are incredibly important, but I just don't, I, it, I think we, it's just easier to talk about them separately than sort of lumped into attenuation. Um, and so this is kind of previewing a little bit um, what we're gonna talk about when we get to radiation force as well. Um, let me tell you, let me give you an illustration here because this is really, uh, really kind of resonates with me to, to use this example. And so here we have a child on a swing, <laughs> child's going back and forth, and you have somebody who's pushing the child, right? So pushing the child means they're putting energy into the system. And when they do that, the child will um, swing up and then they'll swing back again. But because there's losses in the system, there's friction up here, as well as there being wind resistance, that when they swing backwards, they don't necessarily go as high up as they swung forward because um, there'll be losses along the way and so they don't come back as high as they went forward. So those losses now um, are gonna uh, play a role. So we put energy into the system. And then if, you, if there was no loss, they would oscillate back and forth around a zero position, which is pointing straight down into the earth. However, there are losses from friction and wind resistance. So now what's gonna happen is that the sort of the amplitude of the sinusoid is gonna decrease. And what we see is they're gonna oscillate more like this in the purple curve, where their excursion or their oscillation on the positive side, now there's uh, friction and, it's, and losses. And then as they come back this way, then there's the sinusoid is, is decreased and decremented. And so you see that they don't oscillate. They don't come back quite as far on the negative side. And as a result of that, then there's, there's friction. So that means there's, there's a loss of um, energy that goes into heat uh, right where the cables are connected. And also there's um, some heat that's generated um, with the wind resistance. The other thing that's, that's notable here is that if you plot out their um, position, then the, the average position is no longer straight down into the earth, but now it's sort of averaged a little bit forward from where it was before. Um, and that's just, you know, simply they, they go higher up on the front side and not as high up on the, on the back side. So there's a sort of, if you think about it as like, you know, where are they on average, then that's a net displacement. 
Um, so we'll talk about that and how that's exactly what's happening with um, ultrasound. There's loss due to friction, there's heat, and a net displacement forward. Giving you a chance to say something here. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm just thinking out loud. I'm, I'm always going to ask like, well, what is the net displacement forward? Because students are already asking from the last set of questions, but I don't want to <laughs> reveal any of your future slides. I don't know what these slides are, by the way, class. I'm seeing this for the first time. They're very nice, by the way. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, yeah, so let's talk about that when we actually talk about ultrasound. I don't know what it is with the child on the swing. That would be interesting to measure that. Um, all right, so nonetheless, let's talk about ultrasound. So we've got a pressure wave, and we saw this in the last lecture, where here's our pressure wave that's coming by us. Um, remember, tissue is viscous. Viscous means there's resistance to deformation. So you can't really sort of appreciate it on this time and scale, um, but uh, that viscousness, um, you know, we often talk about tissue as being viscoelastic. So there's in some way, elastic means that if you deform it, it's gonna come right back to where it originally was. And viscous means it doesn't really um, come right back or it doesn't, you know, there's some resistance to that deformation. And so um, the, because of that resistance to deformation, it's like in order to deform it, you put uh, um, energy into the system and it, it gets absorbed. And again, that uh, results in sort of a net displacement in, in the forward direction. Now with this movie, let's see if I can get that to play. Um, I'm sort of, um, at, what we've done is we've zoomed way out here and showing, showing you the focal spot. And at the focal spot, there's sort of a number of things that are going on. The, the molecules of the focal spot are going a little bit red. And what I mean by that is that there's an absorption of the energy, they're gonna go it's, you know, there's going to be heat de deposited, so they're going to go up in temperature, maybe a high amount, maybe a small amount, that all depends. And in addition, there's that net displacement. So, you know, of course, those molecules are going to be oscillating with the high frequency sinusoid, but then there's that net displacement. So if you plot out the net displacement, you see the net displacement go forward at the focus. And then once there's that net displacement going forward, then because of the tissue's viscous, it's gonna be like some molecules are connected to the ones beside them. It's gonna to try to pull those molecules along and then there's a resistance and a relaxation. And you can kind of see a shear wave that gets generated right there. So here you're showing just one wave, it looks like, or one cycle, Kim. But if we had many cycles, that net displacement would hold throughout the entire cycling. Is that right? Well, what I've done is I've zoomed out in time and space. So what I'm showing you is a focal spot. So now it, um, instead of looking at sort of on the micron scale, we're looking on the millimeter scale. And our focal spot there is maybe like three millimeters by one millimeter, something like that. So way zoomed out in space, but I've also zoomed out in time. So oh, we're not see. seeing okay. the individual pressure waves come by, but we're seeing, let's apply the focus, uh, apply the ultrasound at four, two seconds, one, two, and then we turn it off and then we see the relaxation. So way pulled out in time as well. And mm -hmm. what we're just kind of depicting now is, is the, the average displacement. So Kim, what if you didn't have tissue at that focal spot? What if you had water? or something. Oh, okay. That's a really good question. Yeah, that's a really good question because water is interesting. It doesn't have as much stuff in it. And that means it doesn't absorb as much ultrasound. It doesn't heat up. It doesn't, um, you know, generate shear waves. So water is quite a bit different. You can still generate motion and we'll do that when we have students um, come into the lab and do a little lab tour. So Water's Does water even have, uh, like, let's call it elasticity, because it never uh, comes back to its sort of original shape? Mm, yeah. I mean, there's like molecular organizational change, you know, maybe yeah. we can think about that. Yeah, but. no, not really. It doesn't come back. That's right. Okay, so, um, so this is the effect of absorption. You can have heat, you can have motion. And this is really important for ultrasound neuromodulation because there's a lot of questions about what exactly is the mechanism here because parts of our, our cells, our neurons are gonna be sensitive to temperature and we're gonna, and our neurons are also sensitive to mechanical forces and deformation and shear stresses. And you can see both of those happening there at the same time. All right, so. That's absorption. We will talk more about how these physical effects act on tissues and neurons to create a biophysical effect.
Okay, so that's just attenuation in general. So let's now talk about skull attenuation because we kind of talked about tissue and skulls are really interesting here for this application because you can't get into the brain and do ultrasound or modulation in the brain without getting past the skull. I mean, you could, you could take the skull off. And in fact, in the early years, so some of the people who first worked on ultrasound or modulation were the Fry brothers and they didn't know how to deal with the skull at the time. So they took the skull off but we have a much better idea how to deal with the skull. So I have like all kinds of information to tell you about the skull. Um, so these are a bunch of uh, pictures of the skulls, of skulls. These are uh, people who were treated for essential tremor here at Stanford Hospital. And these are all axial pictures, meaning they're cutting across this way and they're about five centimeters down from the top of the brain. And what we see is a lot of it differences here. Um, Keith, if I was to ask you, which of these skulls do you think is the most attenuating of ultrasound? Which one do you think would be true? I, I think I always go first row, fourth skull to the right. That's my favorite. Oh, okay. first row, fourth skull to the right. So that means um, this one over here? Yeah. Ah, interesting. No, is that wrong? <laughs> I forget. Oh, that, no, you are, you're wrong. Um, uh. <laughs> <laughs> but nice try. That one is pretty attenuating. So I think we can pretty much agree on which is the, the least attenuating. And so that's this one over here. So it has a very thin skull, pretty homogeneous. And um, in fact, uh, that is very, very little attenuating. In fact, so what we did was we were able to get four times more intensity across that skull than the one who's the most attenuating. And so if you look at these and you say, well, which is the most attenuating? You might look at this one over here and say, look how thick that is. It's thick and it's bright and the bright means it's very dense. And that is all true. It's very dense. This is very dense uh, cortical bone for the most part. But what we will talk about a little bit is that this cortical bone in here is not as attenuating as the trabecular bone that you see over here. And this one right here is a uh, very thick, but very thick trabecular bone. And so that means it's the most attenuating. And, and like I said, um, so what we did here is what we, we raised the temperature in the brain uh, to an ablative temperature for these treatments. And we were able to get four times more temperature rise on this one for the same power as this one over here, um, which is pretty amazing to me that there's that fourfold difference in how much ultrasound gets across the skull. Um, I think that if you talked about the population as a whole, we're probably talking about a tenfold range in how much ultrasound gets across the skull because children were less calcified. So they probably have skulls that are uh, less attenuating. And then there was a bunch of people who were deemed to be not treatable and because their skulls were less amenable to ultrasound going across them. And so by the time you add in children and add in those that were not treatable for this treatment, we're talking probably a tenfold range in attenuation of the intensity. Yeah, um, okay. Students are um, interested in implantables. So for transcranial stuff, you know, there may be some people that just aren't good candidates, but if you implant below the skull or to the inside surface of the skull, you can sort of get around that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And not only that, but there's also, um, well, we'll talk a lot more about how to sonicate across the skull, how to deal with the fact that there's variations. And um, there's, there's so many things to talk about in these images. So like, as I mentioned, this skull over here, very thin, very homogeneous, but you could look at some of the others and not just note their thickness, but let's look at their inhomogeneity. So this one, for example, is really interesting because there's so much variation right there in the skull. And that's gonna give problems because it's gonna, what's called aberrate the beam, it's gonna distort the beam so that we no longer get a very good focus. Um, you can see that on this skull over here, lots of variations, lots of variations. And now we can start looking at all of these and say, hey, let's look at all those variations. One of the skulls I think is really amazing is this one right down here. And the reason why I really like that skull is because the side of it is so thin and so homogeneous and you think beautiful. And then you look at the part up here on the more anterior part of the skull and you think, oh my gosh, you're never gonna get much through there. And it's just so interesting because on the same person you change the transducer from one spot to another spot and then suddenly you know, they become untreatable. So. That's really interesting. Anyway, uh, lots to talk about here, but you asked a question I didn't answer. What was your question? Did I? I'm trying to yeah, remember. Yeah, okay. 
I was just thinking it's amazing how people have evolved such different skulls. Like that middle one on the far left is like built for war. And then that one you just talked about, like you feel like you would just break it with a- I know, I know. <laughs> Some people are, sort of have eggshells. Yeah. Yeah, you know, there's a musculoskeletal uh, researcher at the VA hospital that I talked to at one point, and he, he gave me this really funny quote. He said, nobody studies the skull. It's considered a weird bone because it doesn't respond to load. And so he studies the long bones, you know, the femur, the, you know, the long bones, and they all respond to load. So that's why they tell old ladies who have osteoporosis to get up and exercise because they're putting load on their bones. Their bones will respond by bulking up. But the skull apparently doesn't act that way. So it doesn't respond to load. And even if it did, like, how would you, like, what load exactly would we be talking about? So I don't know. He says, nobody studies the skull. It's considered a weird bone. Huh. <laughs> Pretty funny. Okay, so let's keep going here. Um, if we break down attenuation, then there's generally two major components to it. So there's uh, attenuation due to absorption and then attenuation due to scattering. And so this is just a blow up down here of a particular skull, it's probably one of the ones that we saw on the prior page. And what we see is there's three layers to any particular skull. So there's a cortical bone, an outer layer of cortical bone, and a middle layer of trabecular bone, and then now another layer of cortical bone. And what we see is that, well, I mean, for most skulls, you know, it's kind of a, a continuum. It's not like there's really big differences, but it's sort of a, li a little bit of a transition, you know, a very small transition here. So uh, it, it looks more like there's layers of pure cortical, trabecular and cortical. And um, all of them have, uh, basically there's little canals where there's blood vessels and, and fatty tissue. And in the trabecular bone, there's more of that. Those canals are bigger and uh, in the cortical bone, they're smaller. So generally the cortical bone is, is denser and that's why it shows up bright on CT pictures because CT pictures bright means it's denser. Um, okay, so there's two components to attenuation. There's absorption and we've talked about absorption. So that's where kind of generating heat or the absorption of energy uh, can give rise to that absorption of momentum and sort of that displacement um, of the of the tissue, but there's also scattering. Now, with scattering, what we mean is we have an ultrasound pulse that comes in, and when it comes into the tissue, then scattering means there's going to be a component that's going to go off in different directions. And so, then what actually still comes through here is smaller because part of it got scattered off in different directions. So it contributes to attenuation. Now, what's interesting here is that the cortical bone is uh, the absorption dominates. And in the trabecular bone, the scattering dominates. And so there's just so much more scattering in the trabecular bone than there is in the cortical bone. I think I have another slide uh, coming up. Oh, I have a slide that you haven't seen coming up in just a moment. You have any questions about this before I move on? I think this will come up later, but I was wondering what simulations have a, a big problem with. And I'd imagine trabecular bone's a big one there. Because I don't know, you really need good resolution to see the incidence angles and things yeah. like that, right? Yeah, um, it's hard to measure acoustic properties of the trabecular bone. There's a lot of variation in the literature. We'll talk about that in just a moment. And it's it's that is where our biggest uncertainty is. And it's a little problematic because there's much bigger losses in the trabecular bone. So it's not where we want to be uncertain, but that's where our biggest uncertainty is. Whereas we pretty have a good, pretty good idea of what uh, the acoustic properties are for cortical bone. Mm -hmm. So um, let me tell you about some work that we did where we were actually measuring skull attenuation uh, properties. So we took a couple of human skulls that we got from Skulls Unlimited. And we, uh, this is some work that Taylor Webb did when he was a PhD student here. So he uh, made them into these very small, um, they were maybe a little bit less than a, a centimeter across these bone plugs. And he had different thicknesses They came from trabecular bone as well as from cortical bone. Um, and then it just tells you right there how many of each one. Okay, so he did an experiment where he put his, uh, um, skull fragment into his setup. So he did one measurement without the skull fragment and one measurement with the skull fragment. This is the transducer. So he's transmitting on the transducer. We see the pulses as it gets transmitted towards the skull fragment. And then it gets measured with the hydrophone over here. 
And this is just the measured signal. And then he would you know, digitize that and process it. And so now the question is, in the absence of the fragment, then there's very little attenuation from the water. And what he actually measured is very similar to what he transmitted. With the skull fragment, there's gonna be attenuation. So now what you see is that he was able to measure by doing that comparison, it measured the attenuation of all these skull fragments. Um, he had different thicknesses. He could um, uh, take that into account what the different thicknesses were. And then there were different densities that showing up on the, the CT pictures. Okay, so he gets a picture that looks like this. Um, and then what he would do is he would take the Fourier transform of that. So remember in the last lecture, we talked about the frequency components. And with this pulse that we sent out, it was um, more or less a single frequency because you can see that sinusoid going back and forth, but it had a little bit of bandwidth about it because it was short in time, which means it was a, a, you know, a little bit broad in frequency space. Then as it goes through bone, some frequencies are gonna get absorbed more preferentially versus others. And in fact, the higher frequencies, of course, are gonna get absorbed more. And so, so when we take our Fourier transform of this, well, it, let's say we started out with a pulse that had a, a spectral content that looks like this. Then once it goes through the bone, what we expect is that all the frequencies are gonna go down, but more so in the higher, the higher frequencies. So maybe it does something like, like that where the lower frequencies get attenuated some, but the higher frequencies get attenuated more. So I know my drawing isn't the best, but let me just show you what the data looks like down here. So what we have is a curve. Let's look at the, blue, the yellow one, for example, because it's easy to see. And we have without the bone, sort of this is showing us the frequency content of this pulse right here. So it's brought kind of a broad uh, frequency content without the bone. And then once it went through the bone, that pulse now is shown in the dotted yellow line. And in fact, exactly what I said is true. There's some losses at these lower frequencies here, but a lot more loss at the higher frequencies. And so because he was able to split this out by frequency, then he could then um, you know, look at the loss as a function of frequency. And that's in megahertz. OK, I was just going to say your color bar was in the way. Oh, so uh, sorry about that. Yeah, I don't have any uh, control of where this little silly little thing comes up. Um, OK, so he did this with three different uh, transducers. And so that's the, the, the three different curves, the blue, the red, and the yellows, the three different frequencies of the transducers. There was some overlap between them. So he could make multiple measurements. And from that, he could get kind of a large sampling of the frequency space. Um, and so uh, because he could take multiple measurements from each one of those. Right, and so lots of measurements for each uh, pair of pulses with and without the bone. And what did he get? Um, uh, so he got a, a result that looks like, like this over here on the right where um, he has some attenuation now given in nepers per centimeter. So our color scale and then versus frequency um, in the, the one axis here, the, the vertical axis. He also, what he did was he took images of each of them. And so initially started out with CT images. So over here on the left, these are CT images. And he took them with a lot of different um, parameters. We don't have to get into all of that right now. But what we see is that CT images are shown as a function of Hounsfield units. And when the Hounsfield units go up, that means that they're it's a denser material, so denser this way. So that means this is the cortical bone at the top. And then down here, we have the, the trabecular bone versus the cortical bone. So now, uh, now that he has the, all those images of all those different bone plugs, then he was able to take a region of interest around each one and assign each one now a uh, Hounsfield unit. So for each bone plug, he has the attenuation as a function of frequency and Hounsfield units. All right. Are so, Hounsfield units, um, like a one to one mapping of voxel intensity from the CT scan. Like yeah, that's right. Take it and, that's right. Yeah. And it tells you an average uh, density. Okay. And so what we see is uh, plotted over here. So this right now is uh, on this side is our cortical bone. And what we think is that there's much less attenuation there. And we look at the color scale. In fact, it's very, very blue at all frequencies is very blue. And then as we go to lower Hounsfield units, we're getting into the trabecular bone. So I'll label that as TB. And then we see that the attenuation is going up. Now at low frequencies, it doesn't go up a huge amount, but it goes up a lot more up here in this upper corner up here. And so what that is saying is that attenuation goes up 
as just as we described before, but it gives you the data now. The attenuation is going up in the trabecular bone at high frequencies. And so and what he then did, was able to do is give you plots, you know, versus uh, um, uh, an equation here and lots of equations for all these different parameters, blah, blah, blah. We don't have to get into all of that. But the point is, it gives you the relationship that we talked about. So one of the things that people want to do right now is get CT pictures of the skull so they can calculate the loss across the skull based on the Hounsfield units of the skull, based on the, C the frequency that they have, then they can come up with their attenuation, um, which actually works reasonably well. And there's uh, simulation methods for doing that. And um, you know, by reasonably well, um, I'd say it works reasonably well. <laughs> There is a little bit of uncertainty as to exactly what these parameters were. This piece of work here was one that really kind of did a very careful study of lots of parameters, um, both on the ultrasound side as well as the CT side, and kind of provided all of that data. So it's one of the things right now that we're sort of sorting through is to how do we get from uh, data that we have on our ex vivo pieces of bone and apply that to the real situation. Um, one of the other trends in the field right now is how do we do this without CT pictures, but doing it with the MR bone pictures? And then lastly, how do we do it without pictures at all? And that's a bit tricky. We'll come back and talk about that later. We, yeah, we it, have more. It feels like a really good ML type problem. And I know that you're you know, interested mm -hmm. in moving in that direction, like put in as much information as humanly possible and see if it gets you somewhere near the result. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's right. Um, okay, oh, this is just sort of selling you the same data over again, so I don't have to spend too much time here. This is just showing you um, just three different lines through this plot. So we took three different frequencies, three different lines, showing them there, and then on the, the next one, what we have is uh, three different lines this way and plotting them there, but it's the same thing that I, I just uh, told you about, so I don't think we have to spend any more time there. I'll just say really quickly, Kim, um, so when you have really dense cortical bone, you do get high absorption, but that doesn't seem to play a role in, in the Hounsfield units here, or at least much less of a role. So you'd say that's less important than the reflection scattering type attenuation. Like yeah, that, that's right. I have a, um, a figure coming up, which I unfortunately is not the next slide, but uh, um, what I'm gonna show you are some, uh, some skulls and, and what it's going to show you is that the scattering component is, is much greater than the absorption component. And um, I'll show you the data that we have for that. So for now, you're just going to have to hang on to that thought. OK, so before we get there, let's talk a little bit about SDR. Do you know what that stands for? Oh, I just told you. I flashed it. Into the ratio. Yeah. yeah, I think I knew anyway, but thank you for, <laughs> for doing that. <laughs> Okay. Know, anyway. <laughs> so, so I'll tell you how this is calculated. So this is skull density ratio. This is a metric that's used clinically for uh, the ablation treatments for essential tremor, for Parkinsonian tremor, and for other diseases that they're doing clinically. We'll have a chance in the class to tell you about some of those. Those are high intensities in using a temperature rise. But nonetheless, it's kind of an interesting metric. And there is a question about whether or not this is useful for us in neuromodulation. So let me tell you how this works. Let's say you draw a line from, I don't know, from let's pretend that your, your target is right here at the center of the brain. It may not be, but let's just say that it is. And your transducer is on the outside and you draw a line through there. And through that line, you say, well, what's the, the uh, ratio between the minimum Hounsfield units and the maximum Hounsfield units? And this has to be within the bone, of course. Um, it, it, we're not talking about the brain tissue. So we're not gonna, I'll put brain tissue into the, the minimum, the, the numerator here. What we want is the minimum Hounsfield units as it goes through the trabecular bone and then divide by the maximum Hounsfield units as it goes through the cortical bone. All right, so we do that for one line and then we do that for many lines across because these particular treatments is a hemispheric transducer. So we have um, ultrasound coming in from all different angles across the brain. And so we do that for all of those lines and then we take an average. And that's what the SDR is, the skull density ratio. 
Okay, so Keith, which one is gonna be easier to treat? A skull density ratio of 0.7 or a skull density ratio of 0.4? 0.7. That is good. So um, this one over here probably has a 0.8, maybe a 0.7 right here. And then we're probably getting down to like a 0.4 over here. And so that just means that the signal in that trabecular bone is much lower than it is if you look over here, the, the, the signal in trabecular bone is much higher. And so, um, and, and so what this is basically giving you is an idea of how much trabecular bone there is. What's the kind of the ratio of like how terrible it can be over how good it can be in a sense. It tells you about how much scattering there's gonna be because we really know that the, the trabecular bone is gonna be um, much more scattering, three times more scattering than absorption in that trabecular bone. So um, skull density ratio is something that they use clinically, but there's problems with it. Can you think of any problems with it? Yeah, I, for me, if you went, you know, if you had an image and there was a lot of trabecular bone and you went low, high, low, high, low, high, it doesn't account for the number of sort of transitions, but just the range. And that would be much worse than a situation that was just low, high, low. So I think uh, it's like a simplified version. Is that right? Something that's fast yep. rather than like a measure of entropy or something. Yep, it's fast. But what about skull thickness? Does skull thickness play a role? Oh, of course, of course. Of course. Okay, yeah, I was going a little too far then. Yeah, you were, you were, you were thinking about it really hard, but let's think about it a little bit more simply. And the fact that it doesn't take into account skull thickness and skull thickness plays a, a huge role. So you can imagine something that has a very thin amount of trabecular bone uh, versus something that has a, a lot of trabecular bone and they may have the same SDR, but you know, the, obviously the one that's very thick has a lot more trabecular bone is gonna be a lot harder to treat. So it doesn't take into account thickness, which is a, a huge problem. And then, you know, attenuation and reflections, uh, reflections in there or re refraction, you know, that all of that's sort of not sort of taken into account at all. It's a very simple metric, but on the other hand, clinically they found that it is uh, useful, um, but they had to be sort of careful. So this is, uh, if we look back at the skull down here that uh, I've mentioned before was one that I particularly find very interesting. Now remember they've got, for these treatments, they've got a hemisphere. So they've got transducers all around and I can't draw it down the bottom side because my little color thing is showing up here. Um, and what they calculated in SDR that wasn't too terrible. On average, it was something like a 0.5. Well, then they ended up with um, uh, a little bit of a, a focal spot that was a little bit smeared out laterally. And so they wanted to decrease how much energy came in from this side. And what they ended up doing was putting more energy on the anterior part. And they essentially changed from a skull that was very easy to treat to a skull that was very difficult to treat just by sort of changing which elements they were gonna put uh, most of the energy through. So that's kind of interesting to me. You can imagine again, like, you know, you put your transducer for neuromodulation on the side versus, you know, putting it on the, on the top and, and it's gonna be completely different. Is that like a hole in that person's skull? Did somebody like drill a hole? Was there a surgery that you knew about? <laughs> that sort of bothers you, doesn't it? But yeah. I think it's just the blood vessel that was going right through there. Um, uh, so yeah. in some yeah. sense, I suppose you can think of it as a hole. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, didn't, I mean, I didn't even know there was a vessel like that large that just straight across the whole skull. Anyway, very interesting. <laughs> yeah, you can see little holes in some of the other ones too. Uh, obviously, this one isn't blood vessels. This is up uh, here at the frontal sinuses. Um, but, and then, you know, frontal sinuses up there. But there's other places that you can see little blood vessels. So, yeah. yeah. All right, let's keep going. SDR in the population. So, um, yeah, this is actually kind of interesting. So, we, we have SDRs that are very easy to treat. And this is an example SDRs that are very difficult to treat. And you can see that over there. And there's sort of a, a Gaussian distribution, sort of. And then um, in the clinical treatments, they've often decided that it's very, you know, for a while they had a, a requirement that it had to be about 0.5 or 0.4 or higher. Um, but then that sort of excluded a lot of patients. And um, but they've been figuring out ways to, to treat those as well. And then this is just so, saying that, you know, it took somebody that was sort of here and then because they changed how they, they put the energy on the transducer elements, it kind of reduced their, their SDR and made it a much more difficult skull to treat. 
Okay, here's that slide that's new that I've been meaning to show you. So what we have here is an analysis where we did a simulation and we split up the simulation for all these skulls shown at the bottom. So that we have 17 different skulls. Again, these are all treated for central tremor. And what we can see is there's different shapes and different sizes. And um, some of them are much more cortical, uh, cortical bone, as you can see here, and then some have much more trabecular bone. Anyway, so we split them all up and they're um, kind of, I think the, uh, how did we go? Um, uh, the, the easiest to treat over here to the hardest to treat. Is that the right way we did it? Um, and we broke it down into the reflection losses. Now I think over here, these must be the, on this side, the easier ones to treat, and these are the harder. We broke it down into the losses, whether the losses were due to reflection. So that's at that, that first interface when the ultrasound's coming in and then how much gets reflected at that first interface uh, versus absorption through the skull versus the scattering component through the skull. And what we see is that uh, the scattering component is on average about three times bigger than the absorption component or the reflection component. Um, and then we see also that, you know, that, that's the main thing to notice. Um, uh, what else do we note here? That it's not necessarily size that matters. So you see that there's small ones over, uh, let me get rid of some of my scribbles. There's, you know, generally kind of goes towards smaller, but not necessarily true because this one right here is a bit bigger. Um, it, there's, it doesn't seem to be much consistency, you know, generally maybe kind of going towards thinner. Some of these are, are thinner, so this is large, but thin. Um, you know, there's, it's sort of interesting that there's these, these variations in here where it goes up and down. And uh, that just means that the, you know, there's different skulls where the different components take over. <laughs> I'm struggling to see this, like this difficulty to treat trend from left to right. I mean, I, I guess I, I believe you that it's there because everything's kind of trending down, but yeah, you, were, you said you were having trouble seeing it too. Well, no, it's just kind of remembering, but yeah, it's more difficult on the left, and it is basically because the scattering is is much higher on the left, and then it it decreases as you go to the right. Okay, let's keep going. So we talked about SDR. Now there's some concepts here that we should talk about: reflection, refraction, and layer thickness. Now some of this we put into the supplementary material, and you may have seen some of this. The supplementary material. Um, goes into it a little bit more detail. So I'm just going to kind of talk about it at a very high level. And for the more detail, please see that other lecture. Um, okay, so reflection. Basic idea here is that uh, we have a transducer, and when the transducer is uh, straight on to the bone, there's going to be reflection coming back. Here we see it at that first interface. There's gonna be some transmitted through the bone here. There's gonna be a reflection here at this next interface. Some's gonna get transmitted, some's gonna come back. And then what you're gonna end up with uh, is some of these echoes bouncing around in here. Some are gonna come out, you know, and it, it gets kind of complicated. And we talk in a lot more detail about that in our supplementary material. Um, there's generally a reflection coefficient. And so we're showing it right here for uh, a fat bone interface where you're, the incident angle is zero. So it's kind of straight on. And then what we see is, is we have an angle uh, between the transmitted beam and the surface. Um, as you can see over here with uh, this transducer, now that there's gonna be, a, the reflected beam is gonna go off at an angle, but there's also going to be um, uh, a, a greater reflection as that angle increases. And so that's what we're showing over here is that as the angle increases, let me get rid of my scribbles, as the angle increases, that, that reflection goes up and increases quite a bit. So in other words, if you want to maximize your transmission, what are you going to do? You want the transducer to be more, uh, is orthogonal the word here? Like orthogonal to the bone, or at least yeah. the way you travel. Yeah, you want the surface of the transducer flat against the bone. Because you might think, well, if I want to angle it to get to some other part of the brain, maybe I can just angle the transducer on the skull. but no, not, not going to be a winning strategy. It, yeah. Not going to be a winning strategy. What you're going to have to do is you can potentially, you know, you don't want it flat. You can maybe potentially steer the beam electronically, or you're just going to have to move it to a better position. And then you're going to have to take into account the differences in the skull. So a little bit of a complication here, but that's why, you know, this is interesting. Um, okay, reflections. 
critical angles. And then there's refraction. So as I mentioned, some of the beam is gonna go straight through that interface and uh, as well as some getting reflected back. That which goes straight through is going to be refracted. And how much it gets refracted depends on the angle and it also depends on the speed of sound differences. So we have here, um, this is gonna be our, our skin and subcutaneous fat. We're just basically gonna call it aqueous soft tissue. So it's gonna have a speed of sound that's about 1500 meters per second. And then it's gonna get into the bone and we're gonna call that about 3000 meters per second. So speed of difference, uh, speed of sound is gonna be quite different. And then what we're gonna see is that when we send it in at an angle, that the, the transmitted angle is gonna change. So I'll refer you back to the other lecture in order to get more details about that and quite a bit more elaboration. Okay, you still with me, Keith? Yep, I'm here. All right. And then lastly, it, when it gets really complicated when we have multiple reflections. And so the idea here is that we have the ultrasound that comes in, you see the sinusoid in blue that's coming in from the left. And it comes in here, this is our bone here. So we put in uh, acoustic impedance for bone as opposed to the acoustic impedance for soft tissue on either side. And when it comes in here, uh, there's gonna be potentially an amplitude change because that acoustic impedance difference. And then as it goes through, uh, according to the sinusoid and when it comes out to the other side, again, there could be an ampl amplitude change. Um, and so the blue's coming out of the other side here. Some of it's gonna get reflected back. Some of it's gonna get reflected back. And then you're gonna have uh, multiple uh, components that are coming out and then you can sum all of those up. And when you sum all of those up, now what you can see is that the transmission, how much gets through here, the sum of all those individual parts is going to now depend on the relationship between the thickness and the wavelength. So you could be in a situation where you get a lot more through. That's where the thickness of the bone is uh, wavelength over two. Or you could be in a situation where you get a lot less. Um, so as you go through, as you change the thickness, you go to thicker and thicker this way, then you can see you kind of go through these, these areas where you get more and then less and then more, et cetera. Um, so this is the case where there's no attenuation in the bone. It actually gets a little more interesting if you talk about attenuation because um, then each of these reflected components as they come through, they've seen attenuation along the beam path. And so you don't end up getting this, but you're probably gonna get something that's just gonna kind of oscillate down uh, lower and lower values. So, um, so just, anyway. just thinking about this alone, most people would probably think, okay, so I want my wavelength to be longer than the sort of thickness of these transition states, um, which, you know, it sounds really good in theory, but there's so many things that aren't good about low frequency, like uh, potential for cavitation, or like Kim mentioned, um, the beam size gets really big. So yeah. trade-offs to think about. That's right. So the number of things to think about here, just exactly what you said, if you can, um, have the situation where you are changing your interface to be a smaller and smaller thickness with respect to the wavelength, then what you're essentially doing is coming along this curve. Oh, let me get rid of my scribbles. You're coming along this curve and saying that as it gets thinner and thinner with respect to the wavelength, then you have more and more transmission across it. Yeah. Okay, so a lot of different things going on in the skull. And um, the whole purpose of simulations is to try to take that all to, into, into account. It's a little hard to think about how you might do all this with pen and paper. Let's calculate, oh, three millimeter thickness of skull or six millimeter, let's come up with a loss. Well, there's just so much going on here. And so that's the idea of modeling. Um, there's a lot of work going on in the field right now on how to model all of this. And as you mentioned, another way to do it is to use machine learning, for example. So rather than think about, well, there's reflection and attenuation, let's just pop it into a machine learning algorithm and have it um, figure out what the algorithm is. Um, shall we keep going? Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> it, it sounds like when you're talking about ML that way, it kind of sounds like it's a cheap, easy out, but sometimes it probably works. You know, it's probably not appropriate all the time. You've had good success with ML for, for at least estimating attenuation, right? Yeah, we're looking into it, and the, yeah, I, I'm i not quite sure what to say about it. <laughs> <laughs> Your students will have different opinions. They, they might know even more than we do. 
Okay, so last topic for today, let's talk a little bit about nonlinearity, frequency content, and attenuation. And you haven't seen this part before, have you, Keith? No, it doesn't look like it. <laughs> <laughs> Very okay. nice paint drawing All right. here. All right, so let's talk about linear ultrasound prop propagation. That just means that as the ultrasound beam goes through the tissue, it's going to maintain its sinusoidal form. So in other words, the input here being a sinusoid is going to look like the output there. I should have said it the other way around, that the output looks like the input, um, that it doesn't get distorted. Um, if we have nonlinear propagation, then now our output here, as to, after it goes to the tissue, no longer looks like the input. So what we start to see is that it starts to get this sort of sawtooth pattern a little bit. And that's due to nonlinear propagation. Okay, so I know I can see it in your eyes. What is, what is nonlinear propagation? Where does that come from? And I'll talk about it in another lecture a little bit more. So I'm sort of previewing it a little bit here. The basic idea with nonlinearity is that if you have a pressure wave, so here's our pressure wave over here on the left, that this, the, um, at high pressures, the wave gets propagated more easily. And you know, in some ways that can make sense. So if, you, if it's at high pressure, maybe the molecules are closer together and then um, they can get, you know, push against each other more easily. And then that wave gets transmitted more easily. So in other, way, in other words, the speed of the wave at the high pressure point is faster than the speed of the wave at the low pressure point. So down here, um, the speed of sound is now gonna be uh, a little bit lower and up here, it's a little bit higher. So in other words, what we see is this part is gonna come forward and this part, you know, let's say that this is the speed of sound that this part's gonna come backward a little bit. And you, so you see as this part's come forward and this part's come backward and even more so a little bit more. And you start to see now that, that appearance where it looks a little bit more sawtooth-like. Um, high pressure, it goes faster. The wave travels faster when it's under high pressure. And so now what you have is the situation where the output over here is no longer exactly the same form as the input. And so that's a nonlinear ultrasound propagation. Okay, so ultrasound will propagate nonlinearly through tissue. And it's kind of an interesting result because let me go to the next slide here. Let me do that. Um, so this nonlinearity, it, it, the effect gets bigger at high pressures and at depth. So let's say you have an ultrasound transducer and this is our pressure field. So because we're sort of focusing it here to a point, then um, this goes darker colors is higher pressure. So it's gonna go at higher pressure as it gets deeper because it gets focused simply. Okay, so that's our, our input field. Now, the nonlinearity is going to happen with just naturally as the, the sound beam is traveling through tissue. First of all, at higher pressures. So if you look at a particular depth, it's happening in the center of the beam, which is where it's going to get focused and, and get higher pressures. And then it's going to happen at depth. So it doesn't happen initially, but then it goes nonlinear um, after a certain depth. So now what we have is on this plot where um, the pressure at twice the fundamental. So here we have our fundamental frequency uh, showing you our, our the plot of the pressure field of the fundamental frequency. And now here, this is the twice the fundamental frequency given in blue. And we see that we're going to darker blue, darker blue here. So it, it goes nonlinear as it goes deeper into the tissue. The net result is our actual beam is the sum of both of these. There's a component at the fundamental frequency shown in gray and a component at the harmonics and shown here is the second harmonic shown in blue. So um, that's, that's always, always happening. It goes through the tissue, the high pressure, and as it travels, it goes nonlinear. So what does that mean? Um, well, a number of different things, but let me just follow that train of thought just a little bit more. So initially it's a sinusoid. And if you plot out the frequency components, then there's a Delta function here at the fundamental frequency. And then as it goes nonlinear, what you see is that there are components at the harmonics. So this is the, the, the axis here is the frequency over F naught. So this is just uh, where it says one is the fundamental frequency, two is the second harmonic, it's twice the fundamental frequency and so on. And what we see is that you have components at each of those frequencies and how much is given by this uh, line over here. And so 
Um, so the, this decreasing amount as you go to the, the higher harmonics. Um, so, okay, where are we? We start out with a sinusoid. We end up because of this nonlinear uh, um, propagation that there's now multiple frequency components to our sound wave. Okay, you know where I'm going here, Keith? Because you know this lecture is all about attenuation and it's all about attenuation through the skull. And I've just told you that as the tissue goes through, maybe it goes through a water bath initially, and then we're gonna have the skull um, but if it goes to a water bath, for example, and it starts to go nonlinear, we have multiple frequency components. What do we think is going to happen as it goes to into the skull? So now we've pictured the skull here. Just get your the creative juices going. And you're going to tell me something about the higher frequencies are going to get attenuated first. I was going to ask if you wanted to keep going. I think you have a meeting right now. We could pause it and, and record the rest in a bit. Did you catch that or not? Uh, okay. I'm almost done. Let's just keep going. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. We can keep going. Okay. So the higher frequencies, more scattering, more attenuation uh, across this broadband yes. system. Okay. That's right. So more attenuation at the higher frequencies, what's going to happen. And that is when it crosses the skull. Now, those higher frequencies are going to get attenuated and you're going to end up with just the lower frequencies maintaining and you're going to end up with a beam which is kind of a lot of those nonlinearities are decreased and, and back to something that's a little bit more sinusoidal. So, so the skull almost acts like a, a filter for this broadband signal. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. So it's interesting because people often talk about those nonlinearities. And one of the things that we talk about is, well, um, let's measure the peak negative pressure because if there's nonlinearities, the peak negative pressure, so let's just be clear here. So if this is our ultrasound wave, then this here is our peak negative pressure. This is our peak positive pressure. And if there's nonlinearities, we could be in a situation where they are different. Um, but what happens is if it goes through the skull, we're going to lose a lot of those nonlinearities. And it's not clear to me when we're talking about a focus deep in the brain that we're in the situation where those aren't equal, that I, I suspect that, you know, we're, we're just losing a lot of those nonlinearities and we're, we're, we're back to having those be equal. So it's something we might talk about a little bit later, peak negative pressure versus peak positive pressure. But I wanted to put this in here because the skull will attenuate those higher frequencies preferentially so that we end up getting a lot of rid of those nonlinearities. Okay, let's wrap up this lecture. Uh, okay, here's just the question that I, I already previewed. Oh, no, actually, I'm not sure I did preview this. It, it's just the question is um, now, if people say, well, deep in the tissue, they're, if we're going to absorb those nonlinearities and we're going to have the same, then sort of what's the relevance of measuring the peak negative pressure with a hydrophone? Because the hydrophone is, means that all of this is in a water bath. We've allowed these nonlinearities to propagate. We end up with a beam which is nonlinear, and we may end up with a situation where you know peak negative pressure and peak positive pressure aren't equal to each other, um, just because we're sort of in this water bath. Here's my water. Um, whereas in real life, in, in human tissue, that may not be true. So um, not quite sure what to say about that. Okay, so let's wrap up now. We've talked about a number of things. Basically, why skull is so difficult. <laughs> That's what we talked about today. So I did tell you a lot what I was going to tell you a lot about skull. It just, uh, there's a lot to work on, a lot going on in the field. And, you know, it really would be nice if we could figure out how to uh, know how much ultrasound to apply, even in the absence of all the imaging. Um, but, it, but you know, th there's things that we're working on in order to get like MRI pictures of the skull so that we don't have to use ionizing radiation. So we'll talk more about this. Uh, shall we call it a day, Keith? Yeah, I think that's good. Probably going to be a lot of questions on this. And Kim mentioned a lot of room for innovation. So it's really good stuff. I just want to conclude with one reminder to students, back up your hard drives. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and let's call it a day.